What if I told you that if you wanted to see the benefits of abandoning cell phones within schools, you've got to do a hard ban? Restrictive policies simply aren't enough. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's From Theory to Practice, where I take a look at the research so you don't have to. Now, this week, we're going to do something a little bit different. Rather than diving deeply into one study, I'm going to use a new study just as a springboard to take a look at some mechanisms relevant to this whole cell phone in schools debate. So the paper I've selected is called School Phone Policies and Their Association with Mental Well-Being. Now, this study compared 30 different schools that have varying levels of restrictive cell phone policies. So some schools say you can use a cell phone during recess and lunch and break time, but not during class. Others said you have to keep the cell phone in your bag. We don't want to see it all day. And still others said, hey, you have to put it in a pouch on the wall at the beginning of every class. So different levels of restriction. And what did they find? They found that restrictive policies simply don't have any real impact. As these authors state, school phone policies are not associated with an overall reduction in the time adolescents spend on phones and social media. In fact, they found in those schools with the most restrictive cell phone policies, we do not want to see your cell phone all day, 25% of kids were still using their phone over one hour per school day, that's a six hour day, and 10% were using it over three hours during a six hour school day. That's ridiculous. But to be fair, we've known this for about five years. The data has consistently shown that if you want impact, you have to do a hard ban. Restrictive policies really have never had any impact in schools. And I was willing to just leave it there. I thought this was kind of common knowledge. But then these types of articles started coming out. Cell phone bans in schools don't work, new study finds. And in the first sentence, it says a new study was released that found, once again, cell phone bans in schools do not work. And of course, they're talking about the study we just looked at that did not look at cell phone bans. It was just looking at policies. So here's where I realized there's still a bit of confusion. There's still some conflation going on between bans and policies in the common discussion. So I figured let's clean that up now. Let's put the hard line between bans and policies and see what's going on. So what I want to do is I want to take a look at three mechanisms, three reasons why bans work and policies simply don't. Reason number one is self-evident from the data we just saw. Lack of compliance. When kids are told to simply put away their phone, most of them cannot do it. As we saw, 10% of kids were still using their phone three hours a day. And a couple of research projects have looked explicitly at this. And one found that in environments with restrictions, kids still check their phones seven times on average during a 50 minute class. And when 356 different teachers from K through 12 were interviewed in another study, they flat out said cell phone policies aren't working. And when those same researchers then interviewed 435 students, the students themselves said, yeah, the policies aren't if we don't pay attention to them, we don't do it. So lack of a compliance is a big issue. The next thing is this. It's the concept of craving and focus. So to understand what's going on with craving, we have to talk quickly about habits and habit formation. So a habit forms typically when something grabs your attention. We call these things cues. Now cues can be external or internal, as we'll see in a second. But let's just pretend your phone gives you a ding. Ding. In response to a cue, you can undertake an action. Hey, I'm going to check my emails. Anytime you undertake a successful action in response to a cue, your brain will release a hit of dopamine and you will get a sense of reward. Cue, action, reward. Cue, action, reward. Now, your brain is not stupid. You keep doing this in the same order enough times, eventually your brain is going to preempt you. You're going to go cue, ding, and your brain's going to say, oh, I know what's coming up. And it's going to give you that hit of dopamine here before you've taken any action. Once we've moved from cue, action, reward to cue, reward, action, we've now built a habit. But here's the trick. If you get a hit of dopamine here after you've undertaken an action, it feels good. It feels rewarding. But once you get that hit of dopamine here before you've undertaken an action, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel rewarding. It feels like an urge. It feels like a craving. Now you have to undertake the action just to get a sense of calm and regain homeostasis within the system. So when we say human beings are addicted to technology, what we mean is we built enough habit cycles with tech that we have to behave in a certain way just to maintain balance. Now, why does this matter? So we can imagine our kids have a lot of habit cycles with their phones. That's basically all phones are doing these days. So when you have a policy that takes away the phone, if you simply cannot undertake an action, your brain will continue to release more and more and more amounts of dopamine, making the craving larger, larger, larger. Now let's bring this back to schools. If you have a policy that says, cool, you can use your cell phone during breaks, during recess, during lunch, 
or keep your phones in your bag. We just don't want to see them, in which case kids are going to use them during breaks. This extreme craving will be met within 20, 30, 40 minutes. We call that a short delay. And when you know there's only a certain matter of time until you can undertake that action, the dopamine increases and the habit cycle actually deepens. You make the habit worse. And what's worse is when anyone is in that short delay craving period, attention goes down, focus goes down, memory drops, and learning suffers. The trick is here. If you have a long delay, say an hour or more before I know I can undertake that action, then you get a peak and decline of dopamine. Dopamine will start to drop, the craving, the urge will go away, and now you can start to focus your attention again. So when kids know all I gotta do is wait 40 minutes to touch my phone, that makes learning worse and actually deepens the habit. But when kids know, man, I gotta wait six, seven, eight hours until I can check my phone, that's when the system can start to calm down and we can start to rewire this habit cycle. If I don't have my phone, how else am I supposed to act in this context to make it meaningful, e.g. learning? Now, I wanna just real quick say, Cues aren't always external. A ding on your phone is a cue, but most cues tied to the phone are internal. If I feel slightly uncomfortable, I'm going to check my phone. If someone asks me a question I don't know, I'm going to check my phone. A lot of the time learning is uncomfortable, and you can assume that discomfort is probably what's driving kids to access their phone. So only once we get rid of that phone for extended periods of time can kids start to rewrite that habit cycle and determine how else can I deal with this feeling of discomfort? And one final mechanism I want to take a look at is here. It's a concept called consolidation. So in your brain, you have a structure called the hippocampus, and we basically call this your gateway to memory. Anytime you're learning school-type material, that information has to make it through your hippocampus in order for you to form a memory about it, for you to learn it. So when you're in the throes of learning, you can assume your hippocampus is on. It's encoding information. And when you're done learning, it will then go back to normal. But here's where things get good. Once you finish learning, once you step away from a learning situation, your hippocampus is now going to start recycling that memory. It's called hippocampal replay. In a very real sense, your hippocampus is just going to keep replaying what you learned again and again and again. And this is the mechanism by which we take one exposure to an idea and actually turn it into a deep memory. In fact, some data suggests over 90% of waking learning happens after you stop during this hippocampal replay. So what's the problem? It turns out we have an issue called cognitive interference. So if after learning, you immediately go into another deep cognitive task, your brain simply doesn't have time to enter into that replay mode. You don't replay those memories, your learning starts to suffer. So in a school where cell phones are hard banned, after class, kids are usually going to go out of class and they're going to hang out. They're going to talk with one another. They're going to eat food. They're going to kick a ball around, have a snack. All of these behaviors allow for hippocampal replay to happen. They are not cognitive enough to interfere. So while they're hanging out with their friends, they're actually deepening their learning. But if after class I immediately pick up a cell phone, cell phones are wickedly cognitively demanding. All we're doing half the time on those things is multitasking, and that will absolutely interfere with that cognitive replay, that period of rest we need after learning for the brain to do its thing. So if you have a hard band, you can expect deeper learning simply through these periods of rest. But if you allow cell phones, even just between classes, at recess, at lunch, these periods where it seems like it doesn't matter, it will negatively impact learning because it interferes with the biological process. And in a final twist, somebody said, okay, what if we do cognitive interference? What if we force kids to keep thinking and learning, but some kids have a task on a piece of paper and other kids have that same exact task on a cell phone? Is the cognitive interference identical or is it worse on one tool versus another? And what did they find? The kids doing the exact same task on a cell phone had about a 50% larger hit to their memory consolidation. So even if they are going to do something cognitive between classes, simply doing it on a phone makes that impact worse on their previous learning. So now then, let's bring this back to us. What are some ideas for us as teachers in schools? Well, first and foremost is the obvious one. If we want to see benefits of well-being and learning in schools, it's not enough to just restrict cell phones, to tell kids to put it in a pocket, put it in a locker, put it in their backpack. You got to get rid of the phones. They simply cannot exist on a campus. And I think the interesting aside from that then is how do we as teachers, adults, comply with that as well? If our kids simply cannot bring it anywhere near campus, 
Should we be allowed to? I mean, honestly, what can we do with a cell phone that we can't do with a computer or a hardline phone? So do any of us need cell phones at school? And if we're going to ban it, does it make more sense to ban it for everyone across the board? Will that give us more buy-in, more success? The next idea is this. If you do choose to do a ban, you've got to give it time to see the benefits. It is very hard to break habit cycles. So just like if you quit smoking, you've got about a two to three week window where things are going to get worse before they start getting better. It's going to be the same with cell phones. So if you put a ban in place, do not expect wonderful data in the first one, two, three weeks. Give it about a month. At about the month mark, that's when you really should start seeing changes and start interviewing your students and your teachers. Have you noticed differences? Are you acting differently? Are you behaving differently? Are your relationships Relationships better, what's going on in class. Give it time. At about the month mark, that's when you'll really start seeing benefits that simply won't come if you're doing restrictive policies. And last but not least is this, is we've also got to think about phone time outside of school. If kids know for the six hours at school I can't use my phone, but as soon as I'm out of school, I can, what you see is the kids who don't have it during the school day will use it more at night and over the weekend. It's like they got to make up for lost time, so they really cram tech home. So how do we get these ideas to parents as well and start to say, hey, we're going to ban cell phones at school, but now at home, you also need some sort of structure. I imagine some parents will be fine banning phones for their kids, but others who want their kids to have phone, how do we have structure in place at home so that they're not overdoing it? Now, I know we got that line between school and home, and it's very hard for us to jump that line if we should at all. But if we can get parents along with us on this journey, it's going to make it so much easier, so much more powerful. And I'm going to leave you with one final thought. Now, I work a lot with schools, so I've been in hundreds of schools over the last couple of years, and I've seen dozens of schools that have had hard policies and then reversed them because they didn't see the benefit they wanted. They said, we're going to put in a cell phone policy, don't use it during the day. But two years later, they revoke it because they're like, eh, it didn't happen. But one thing I have never seen is a school that has banned cell phones and then returned to allowing them. Any school that goes with a hard ban, so far as I've seen, sticks with it. It works. It's beneficial. At no point two, three years down the track do they go, you know what? Things were better when they had their cell phones. Bring them back. So again, those schools might exist out there, but I've simply never heard of them and never seen them. A policy tends to fail, but a ban tends to work. And once it works, it tends to stick. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope you got something good for that. Uh, if you want to keep up with what we're doing, you can take a look at us at lmeglobal.net or take a look at our award-winning science of learning programs for both teachers and students called the Learning Blueprint. Otherwise, thank you all so much, and I'll see you at the next one. Bye, y'all.